On International Holocaust Remembrance Day, January 27, 2023, Remember.org remembers our friends in the community who have passed away, Gustavus Stenberg Lindberg and her daughter Ariella who read a poem, Abram Korn, a survivor, and the focus of Abe's story, whose son Joey will read memories of his father, Count Folk Bernadotte, and women in the Holocaust who are often forgotten, but we remember them. And that's a photo of Lisi Borsum, part of the White Bus Rescue. First, our dear friend Alan Jake Jacobs, who passed away this year, and leaves a legacy of love, photography, and great heart, especially in his project, The Virtual Tour of Auschwitz, which began and won the Social Impact and Media Award by Adobe. But even more importantly, there were over 4 million people saw his work, and it was one of the first projects that helped the museum at Auschwitz get online who has now created their own virtual tour that's been updated and is just amazing. And so inspired by not only the work, but the friendship that Jake showed to us at remember.org, our community, and sharing it so people will remember. But more than even the virtual tour, you'll find Alan's photos throughout the site from Auschwitz, from Birkenau, Mauthausen, along with helping us put on Jan Karski's paintings and the Then and Now exhibit. And Alan was a photographer after he retired, but he also lived with a group of firefighters and wrote an amazing book filled with photos of his experience documenting their work. So Alan Jake Jacobs, we miss you. We thank you for all you've shared and we'll do our best to keep sharing it and are so inspired by the heart, soul, and friendship you showed us and the Remember.org community. And now let's hear a poem by Gustawa Stendig Lindbergh, physician, scientist, and poet of blessed memory, a Holocaust survivor, and a poem read by her daughter, Ariella. A poem written by my mother, Professor Stendig Lindbergh, Holocaust survivor, physician, psychiatrist, scientist, and poetess. This is when she was around 17 years old at Bergen-Belsen and Auschwitz period. And um, She kept writing poetry in her mind and also sometimes without pen and ink or paper. And um, after the war, she wrote them down and we published her books after that also, years after that. Auschwitz. Ash read the burning sky. The cannons of chimneys spit out souls. Here come you, who want to warm your hands in the hell of fire, partaking crime made legal beyond all record of man's violence. Here come you, abjectly, cold, able to turn a deaf ear to the cry, the children's cry, in this low building where murder is industry. A civilized people out to the Genghis Khan, outrank the hordes of Huns, thus seal their doom. Put a white sheet of silence over the low building. Hang a veil over the burning sky, hush the cry of terror. Cut out this unbelievable from the heart of memory, too much for human eye or ear, too much for human soul to bear. Earth never knew such crime. Free us from a witness burden. Such sorrow is God's to prevail. And I saw him cry.
Welcome to Dowsers.com. I'm Joey Corn. I want to talk to you today about Abe's story, a Holocaust memoir. Abe's story is an incredible story about an incredible man, my father. He survived five and a half years in Nazi ghettos and concentration camps. He lost his entire family um, to the Nazis, his two little sisters and his parents, and many members of his extended family. And he suffered years of torture, uh, deprivation, um, you know, starvation, uh, work, 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 having to work, 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 which his work ethic is part of what kept him alive through the, through the Holocaust. He, the, the, you know, a lot of people are afraid to read Holocaust memoirs. But this is different. Instead of getting you angry when you read it, instead of getting you depressed when you read it because of the sad, terrible circumstances, my father's story is uplifting. It inspires everyone who reads it. That's what I hear more than anything about Abe's story. Number one, he, was a, he, he survived, dad survived with his dignity and his humanity intact and his belief and not only in God, but in man, in the inherent goodness of mankind, and in the inherent goodness that's in every person in life. And he even saw that, that goodness in many of the Jew, Germans um, and, and in many of the Nazis that were, in the, that were the guards and the, um, in the camps and even some of the leadership of the camps. And... Germans helped my father from the beginning of his story till the end of his story. There's even a chapter called Good Germans. And to give you an example, my father uh, was a was a um, ultra-Orthodox Jew. Um, and he, in that day, and in that class, that part of, that sect of Judaism, you didn't even marry outside of your class in the sect, much less outside of Judaism. After the war, my father lived in Germany for a while, rebuilding his life. And he immediately got a job and went to school. He wanted to be an electrician. He met my mother, a German Lutheran. They fell in love, and he felt like, you know, he deserved some happiness. In 1949, my father immigrated to the U.S. right after they got married. It took her another year to come over. And they found the American dream. Uh, dad, dad got his first job, which, which was also his last job, because the, the couple, Agnes and Jack Platt, Platt, that gave him his first opportunity saw his potential. And he helped them grow that tiny little auto parts, parts store in Augusta, Georgia, into the largest warehouse distributor of auto parts in the region, one of the largest. And, you know, and then he finally got to the point where he had, he had his own house built, and he finally got to the point where he owned that business when my godparents died and left it to him. And again, he found the American dream. What other country can you come to with nothing? He came with just a small suitcase with a few clothes, and he didn't even come with the language. And he really got everything, everything he ever hoped to have. Again, where else but in the United States can you do something like that? I'm proud to be my father's son. He's my hero. Final word about the count who conducted this historic rescue using the white buses as well as other means of transportation to save so many lives. After the white bus rescue, the United Nations Security Council appointed him to be the special mediator in the growing Middle East conflict. This was a unanimous choice and an important mission for world peace. However, many in Israel feared that the Count would be a stooge of the British and understate the importance of a complete state of Israel. Today, we call it a possible two-state solution.
As a result of this fear, the Count was assassinated by a terrorist group called the Stern Gang on September 17, 1948. Some people would consider the Stern Gang freedom fighters, while others consider them terrorists. It depends on your point of view. After his death, his body was flown back to Sweden, where he was given a state funeral. The famous diplomat Abba Iban represented Israel. He is survived by his wife and two children. Hello, I'm Roger Rufo, and over the past several years, I have had the privilege of working with two graduate students, Caitlin Trafistant from Auburn University of Montgomery and Allison Stone from University of Colorado, Denver. Our work has focused on the dramatic rescue by the Swedish Red Cross of 15,345 prisoners from the Nazi concentration camps during the very last chaotic weeks of the Second World War. During April and May, over 30,000 people were rescued on the white buses as they became known and were transported by rail, train, and boat to Sweden. There they were greeted by volunteers and members of local communities, nursed back to health, and hopefully repatriated to their homeland or some country of their choosing. One of the issues that we encountered was the rather unknown and misunderstood role of women during the Second World War. The Holocaust literature documents that this has been a problem. Women are often neglected or are seen as passive victims and really just mothers trying to take care of their families. In fact, outside of the camps, women served as spies, worked successfully as saboteurs, carried messages, and did numerous other forms of resistance. In Judaism, staying alive is considered, can be considered an act of resistance. Within the camps, women were anything but passive. The stories, especially those in Sarah Helm's book on Ravensbrück, document how the women in this women's camp organized, took care of each other, bribed guards, were able to get messages out, and did other forms of resistance. They were anything but passive. The stories of the men and women that you will read on this website are amazing. While we do not think that these people would have considered themselves heroes or heroines, their actions are certainly heroic. We hope that you are informed and stimulated to learn more about the white bus rescue and the conditions that led to this amazing story. Thank you.